G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle. I've done these sorts of videos before, talking about the issues over at Games Workshop. And to be honest, I'm sick of trying to spread a message over and over again on how you as a consumer have rights that you should be exercising and trying to perform consumer advocacy on your behalf, only to get labeled as salty for bringing up these points. That's on me, I suppose, for my delivery. Anyway, with that in mind, I intend to treat this video as a culmination of sorts, so I can avoid discussing the topic again in any full-length video. So, preamble aside, I intend to explain to you some of the problems with Games Workshop as a company, as I perceive them to be, how it affects you, the customer, and my solutions were I to have some sort of uh, mystical position within the company of unchallenged decision making. With that, we need to start at the source of all of the problems, and that is the management of the company. Games Workshop management is nothing more than a boys club. You're either in it or you're out of the company. This corporate nepotism has profound consequences, where the decision making is based on emotion as much as logic and reason. I cannot prove any of this to you without breaking the trust that others have put in me, but if you doubt it's the truth, go and watch any of the publicly available content put out by disaffected X Games Workshop managers and how they describe the corporate structure. If you frustrate anyone in the middle to high levels of management, they will go from being your most supportive best buddies to making your life so miserable that you leave or make a mistake so they can dismiss you. This is further reinforced by their hiring policies, when attitude not experience with the hobby or in sales is what they're chasing. They want a hype man, someone to make a bored looking kid into a sugar hyped maniac begging mum to buy them a box. Whilst this type of sales tactic has its place, it isn't the domain of a company of this size and professionalism. Worse, the community looks at a company like this and thinks the management must know what they're doing because they make money and it's a huge business. They couldn't possibly hire below average staff and put them in management positions. Well, I hate to say it, but this actually happens in many large corporations and it is not limited to just Games Workshop. Communities always assume that for some reason the management is full of seasoned businessmen with, you know, huge experience in auto companies, gaming brands, clothes lines, whatever it might be, with fancy degrees. But the reality is kind of the opposite. I was senior management at a plastics factory at 33 years old. I don't have formal business training that I completed or lean manufacturing qualifications, but I was capable and competent, so I got the role and I made it work. This is what many companies do. They take a person who is perceived to be competent and capable, or who knows the right people, or some combination of the two, and they put them into these positions. The writers working on the heresy were apparently floor workers in the factory who applied for the jobs when the openings became available. These workers are essentially being given the chance to prove themselves with a flagship IP, and this is laudable that staff can progress through the ranks, but it is a major shift for them and a huge risk to the company with no fallback. So with these points in mind, let's look at the Games Workshop management where there are multiple executives in the company in charge of the different sections of the business, such as UK sales, global sales, etc. Each of these people have people working below them whose whole job is just to curate the data brought to them by other managers who have already curated the data brought to them by other managers. What we're seeing is people who exist to be mouthpieces for their departments, with everyone else doing the work and just passing the final numbers on to them and they just read them out of meeting. It's corporate bloat 101, and it's incredibly common globally, not just within Games Workshop. I'll make a statement now which is not said enough, and that is that just because something is a widespread practice, it doesn't mean that it's acceptable or tolerable. Therefore, one of the first actions I would take would be to start gutting the glut of jobs for the boys within the company, and starting to thin out management. The management department should not be larger than most other sections of the business. It is expensive, it doesn't do its on paper job particularly well, and it's full of yes men who are sucking up to the manager above them because they hope that one day they'll get their job, rather than doing the best job they can. I want to stress that this isn't a problem with every single member of the management, 
but it's significant and widespread enough that it has to be understood and has truly reached the public ear, demonstrating that it needs to be fixed. Now, onto less salty stuff, the prices. The next problem is with the cost. This is a no-brainer. The company has chosen a price point which is exponentially increasing versus the cost of actually conducting business. This is because bloated costs lead to greater numbers at the end of the financial year, covering up the players who leave with the spending of new blood. This approach only works so long as people tolerate the prices and Games Workshop seems to be slowly approaching the zenith. I'll help you visualize this with an example. Let's pretend you're a model maker and you decide you're gonna make a game called, I don't know, Battle Mace. And you sell 100 models a month for $10 each. This nets you $1,000 per month. Now, after a couple of years of selling Battle Mace miniatures due to inflation costs and other things like that, increased staff wages, whatever it might be, you decide to increase the price to $20 per model. This doubling of cost, it's a lot, but the fans really love Battle Mace. They just can't get enough of it. And yeah, you lose a few people along the way, but new customers come in and you still sell your miniatures and now you're making $2,000 a month. Still making just 100 sales. Now you get a team of investors on board. They come in and they're demanding growth. They reason that, hey, you know, the fans, they stuck around for you doubling the price. Why not pull that move again next year? Up the price to $30 a model. And they reason that, hey, at $30 a model, you're actually doing less of a price rise. Proportionally, it's, it's half of the price rise that you just did. Fans will probably tolerate it a lot more. If they sell the $100, uh, 100 models this month, they'll make an extra $1,000 for doing literally nothing. Now, unfortunately, they kind of underestimate the fans of Battle Mace, and a few of them start to bail out. Instead of selling 100 models this month, only 75 get sold, and despite the models costing 50% more, they only make $2,250 this month. An extra profit for nothing, yeah, and growth, but at the expense of quantity of sales. Frustrated by this insufficient growth, the company's shareholders demand the growth get increased, and another $10 price rise takes place. The price per miniature is now four times what it was when they founded the company Battle Mace. However, the fans, they can't keep up with the rising costs, and this month, they lose another 25, leaving just 50 of the original players each buying one model per month. Now you're selling just 50 models a month, but at $40 each, and yet you're only making $2,000. Despite doubling the cost of the miniatures, the company is back to the money they made when they sold 100 models a month at half the price. The shareholders are annoyed because their product costs a lot more than it used to, but it isn't bringing in the revenue with players dropping off. Battle Mace is now stuck in limbo. They must try and draw in players faster than they're losing them with every price hike, or else they won't have any actual growth. And that would be the death knell of the company. This is where Games Workshop was when Kirby left and Roundtree took over. Roundtree has taken them back to the point where they're selling the $30 models. Yes, they're making money, but they are slowly losing players, and it's just that the price that they're increasing sales by is slightly outpacing the rate at which people leave the game. And by slightly outpacing, I mean to the tune of several million dollars, if not several hundred million dollars. But when you consider the size of their market, it's not as impressive as it looks. This is the cycle Games Workshop is in currently. The company is teetering on the edge of pricing themselves out of the market, hemorrhaging players, but managing to bring in enough people still who will buy the big expensive box games and ensuring that the company still grows. With this in mind, we have seen boxed games, such as equivalent 40k starter sets over the years, growing cost by 250% in just 20 years. At the same time, Wage growth for the customer was only about 60% during the same time frame. In other words, the price is increasing four times faster than your pay is. If we take today's generations with the instant gratification mindset that has slowly crept in, combined with the slow burn that is this hobby, 
And this puts the customer in a bit of a weird place. Sales tactics from days gone by would include the sales staff at the local games workshop pointing out how you make so much of a saving in a starter set compared to a regular product. But if you're a parent looking at this hobby and you have the option of a brand new gaming console such as a, a PlayStation or an Xbox or taking the gamble that your kid will take up this expensive hobby, buy the paints, the clippers, learn to put it all together, paint it, play it whilst not losing interest along the way, that's actually a tough sell for the average parent. And when I've polled friends who have children and the parents themselves are not interested in Warhammer, they express this very sentiment. They know that a PlayStation will appeal to their kids and that the PlayStation will remain relevant for a long time because kids rarely grow out of them. On top of that, it's easy to buy games and understand exactly what the kid wants versus the confusing product range at Games Workshop with 90% of their products unavailable in their stores. It was also pointed out that the second-hand market for video games and consoles is far stronger than the used Warhammer market where everyone wants to pay far less than the retail price for already assembled and painted miniatures, no matter how good the quality is. Another factor affecting price, and one that ties into the customer confidence relationship, is this newfound and ridiculous habit since 8th edition 40k, where multiple codexes are released in the dying months of an edition, with a new edition announced just a month or so after some of these drop. The latest offenders being the Imperial Guard and Corn Codexes, who play the entire 9th edition with either an old codex or no codex. This problem isn't so bad for those with established forces, but for those who are making a new army, it's a real kick in the teeth as the average hobbyist is a rather slow creature, with, you know, pesky things like life and other responsibilities creeping in, meaning that they end up needing something called time to build and paint a new army. Add to this the downright customer screwing methodology of partial releases, where a faction has only half a dozen identical units released in a rather well, lackluster launch, only for additional units to be added in the next edition in an attempt to force you to buy a whole new round of kits and books. Again, I'll use the Corn Berserkers as an example of this because there is no way that that faction is just three infantry kits and a couple of characters. With the current cost of their unbuilt, unpainted kits, it's also worth looking at competitors at games like X-Wing and Star Wars Legion, where you can pay minimal cost to get pre-painted, pre-built miniatures with all of the relevant rules included and with a decent duration of system life between updates. This is crucial to bear in mind as that's the real competition here. A huge IP comparable with Warhammer in the form of Star Wars, even if it is severely damaged brand these days, which has broad appeal, offering people an easier entry level. Like it or not, that's a legitimate competitor. At the other end of the spectrum, you have a game like Bolt Action, which offers people historical battles with a similar scope to Warhammer, but with an arguably far superior rule system, a lower cost of entry, with better balance, but lacking the wow factor with their very mundane kits. These are competitors, and you cannot simply ignore them as every passing day they grow their systems and players introduce them to their friends, often people who have been disaffected by Games Workshop, they're the ones joining these systems. Additionally, there are issues with FOMO purchasing, or the fear of missing out, being used to hype up and sell product. Therefore, when coming up with solutions to the price issue, we have to take all of these factors into account. So, I've just said a lot of stuff, let's summarise it a bit. First, releases need to be more consistent in their size, not just three units, wash your hands of it. Releases need long enough shelf life so that the players aren't frustrated. Also, obsolescence of books needs a separate solution. Hype-driven sales are a necessary reality, and price must be proportional to income. That last point is very important, as no amount of pretending you're a luxury model maker will make up for the fact that your kits demonstrably are not the greatest in the world. They're often very good kits, solid in the plastics department, but comparative to high-end military modeling kits with things like etched brass and precision machined parts, they pale in comparison despite costing sometimes more. 
and their resin range is markedly inferior in quality to many smaller resin casters, with the Forge World recasters often actually making better quality products than the parent company originally did. Therefore, I have the following range of solutions. Firstly, a halt on price rises, which is strongly communicated to the community. The company has learned to operate at the current price point, so we can't just come in here and slash prices without knowing for certain that our volume will pick up enough to compensate for it. That would be company suicide, no matter how much we want it to happen. Then, certain kits will have to be lowered in price to act as further loss leaders. That is, items which don't have the profit margin the company would like as a trade-off to move more volume. Secondly, there would be more starter sets for all of the game systems, which feature a balanced army of identical points. Games Workshop has already made some steps in this direction, which is positive. These kits will all be the exact same price, regardless of faction, regardless of model count, because you as a Tyranid player deserve to have the same cost of entry, and that's the key, entry into the game as a Custodes player. This will be done in order to help encourage players to experiment with new factions and create some diversity beyond just Space Marines. Thirdly, there will be a range that is designed, much as it pains me, to be a price gouge FOMO purchase. This would present itself, however, in a very unique and different way. There would be the typical box starter set for the core game and at a great price, but there would be a collector's edition, which is marked up in price over this and features a limited edition miniature, which is only available in this box set. This is done because for you, the player, you have the choice of buying the cheaper option or paying that little bit more or a lot more to secure that really awesome looking miniature, even if it doesn't really do anything. It's basically upselling you just like going into a fast food outlet and buying a larger sized meal. So I would also have a range of alternate sculpts and quote unquote classic sculpts, which are re-released in a specific window, such as at Christmas time in limited quantities and at premium price points. To take the sting off this, purchases will be notified several months in advance what miniatures will be available and when in order to allow them time to plan their purchasing rather than springing the surprise on them. Current Games Workshop likes the fear of missing out aspect of the you have only one week to buy it or it's gone approach. And whilst yes, this does work, it is incredibly frustrating and you lose a ton of goodwill with such tactics. By offering a starter kit at a reasonable price, as well as the premium kit with the collectible miniature, you are giving people the best of both worlds, cheap or premium. It's up to them to decide what they prefer. The fourth change I would make is to bring back the Skulls or Loyalty Program. This would be an app-based reward system where you recruit points based on your purchasing. The more you spend, the more you earn, and these points can be redeemed to buy kits just like the 1990s loyalty program. The kits are so cheap to produce at Games Workshop that the occasional kit given away for free to a person who has spent thousands with your company in a month, that's a pretty damn easy sacrifice to make and it will bring a ton of community goodwill as you're recognizing their loyalty and rewarding them for it. Sadly, a scumming tactic should be employed here in that the points accrual should be designed in such a way that the proportional gain to reward, it should always be encouraging people to save their points a little bit longer and just aim for the next tier on the list, dragging out their spending prior to receiving the reward. So to sum up my financial changes, one, halting price increases whilst providing some decreases to encourage more volume sales in starting areas. Second, cheaper entry level kits across all systems. Third, a two-tier op uh, options for starter sets with and without limited edition miniatures sold at a premium as an upsell item combined with special legacy kits being sold in the holiday period with appropriate prior notification and total clarity to the customer. And fourth, 
a loyalty program to reward the big spenders and encourage them to continue that behavior. Books and balance. The current style of book releases and balance is a shambles. Books come and go in as little as six months in some cases, with releases slated to drop just to increase quarterly sales, rather than as a true release to satisfy the player base. On top of this, balance is handled differently, mostly badly, uh, across all of the game systems, with 40k often having day one FAQs, but 30k waiting months on end with only the sound of the wind in the trees to comfort a slowly more aggressive community. To combat this, I have a simple solution, in theory, but a little bit more difficult to execute in reality. I will call this solution two-way communication. It's a shocking concept, I know, but it's all about the execution, because how do you talk to this community without having a forum that descends into just screaming and raging and madness and arguing? Well, to do this within three months of any rules releasing, a poll will be created online, which will examine the released rules. This poll will mostly use fixed drop-down options rather than written feedback in order to reduce the workload of the staff reviewing the data and allowing automated collation of the data. If you ask players questions, such as which right of war is overpowered, select up to five options, and 90% of responders pick the stone gauntlet from the drop-down box, well, you might sit up and take notice of it being broken. Conversely, if nobody picks Liberation Force as overpowered, you can safely be assured that it's within the okay zone, on the overpowered front to a good margin of error. A month after completion of the survey, an FAQ will be released and a digital version update made to the rules. Then, three months later again, a further follow-up survey will take place to assess the impact of these changes and act accordingly. Whilst this may seem excessive, I don't intend to release editions or books at the pace of current Games Workshop. What they're doing now is too fast and leaves people with no time to actually enjoy an edition, with their books being all over the place regards balance or release timeline. Three years is too short for an edition. Five to eight years should become the new norm, and I feel that with constant balance changes, there is plenty for the writing teams to do, and edition fatigue will not set in as quickly as it does now if the balance issues are addressed with the system slowly getting ironed out over time. In addition to this, the rules for all factions, let's just say codexes here for ease, will become a digital set of rules which will be available as a free download across all systems. There will also be a simultaneous physical release which will be a premium art and hobby book explaining conversions, colour schemes, hobby tips, painting tutorials, etc. This way people get their codex and they are no longer limited to buying the rules to test if they want to buy the models. You want to play Dark Elder? Cool. Sample these rules for free. You like the Dark Elder? Well, why don't you buy some now? Hey, while you're at it, why don't you buy the premium codex for them too? Games Workshop has made some weird moves in this direction on and off over the years, but usually stumbles at the finish line, especially compared to their competition. In addition to all of this, I would stage campaign books that take place in the past, which bring back some legacy characters or units, and tying into the Christmas character sales, with battles such as the First Tyrannic War, Badab, Armageddon 1 and 2, all being explored on some level in order to have something that can be purchased outside of the big tentpole edition and codex releases, something to fill the gaps and it's just a fun narrative. 3D printing. Unlike Games Workshop currently, burying your head in the sand won't solve this problem. 3D printing tech is at the point of basically being comparable quality to Games Workshop's releases. I mean, they 3D print all their prototypes. There are many pitfalls here, so let's look at the primary ones. First, there is the ready aspect. You want a model? Download it. Put it in the printer, and something the size of a tank can be done in half a day now, with a bunch of the more annoying and fiddly parts that you would normally have to assemble being already moulded into the print. This compares to ordering online or driving to a store to buy a kit, which costs infinitely more. 
Secondly, versatility. 3D printing allows customization, the creation of alternate variants of kits and units. Fighting this trend is nearly impossible as people want to have that customization. And unless the company is willing to make an infinite range of products, they're going to fail at ownership over this market. So how does one combat the 3D printing revolution? Well, you do it with a multifaceted approach. Firstly, humans tend to lean towards the path of ease. If you can offer convenience, people will tolerate higher prices, so long as you don't push them too far. Games Workshop can produce excellent miniatures in easy to work styrene plastic. Therefore, you keep that as your domain as a company. You then produce a range of pre-supported STLs via your company website. Sure, people might pirate them, who cares? If it's more of a pain for them to pirate them than it is to just get them off you for cheap on your site, people will just come to you. You're trusted, you're virus free. You offer pre-supported files and tutorials on how to print the miniatures. In addition to this, you also align with a reputable 3D printing company and you have an officially endorsed printer designed to work with your product. You make it as simple as possible for people to purchase and use these resources. You will not kill your injection molding market, I can assure you. You'll instead be targeting a broad range of customers with versatility and variety using this approach. Print your resin character on our printer that we sold you and put him in the plastic army that we also sold you. That's a win-win. The next key here is to sell the rights to produce upgrade components to third parties. You can sell shoulder pads or such, helmets, backpacks, under the agreement that Games Workshop gets to sign off on the objects to approve them, but in exchange, the 3D artist or seller gets to use your brand name in their marketing, and they are now responsible for policing this section of the IP on your behalf. You're not only shifting the onus onto those parties, but you've also provided for customization and you get to decrease the size of your mainline product range by removing all these additional SKUs for things like shoulder pads from the inventory, allowing more important products to be made in plastic instead. Remember, Games Workshop sells convenience, not infinite variety. Third parties sell variety, not convenience. Dominate both markets by taking an approach like this. Next, the storefront. For years, Games Workshop has tried to downsize all but a couple of flagship stores, as stores have big overheads. They have downsized staff to save wage money, they've tucked stores down back alleyways in bad neighborhoods, but they expect their managers to hit ever-increasing sales targets in these terrible locations. It's a self-defeating exercise. Stores are going to be expenses, yes, but I propose having the stores in cities be in good locations, prime storefronts in malls or in the street, with the Apple treatment. And that's why I chose this picture of, I believe it's London Games Workshop. When you walk into these stores, you shouldn't be greeted with a smelly, dingy nerd dungeon. These are going to be sleek, modern, and inviting. There will be a staff member running games, one teaching painting, a manager or greeter performing customer service. The front windows will be filled with lavish painted miniature displays. No more grey diarrhea on 300 millimeters. And I want to see a six foot window full of color with TVs in there playing your IP. The store will cross market this IP. Let me, let me set the scene for you, okay? You see the intro trailer to Space Marine, Dawn of War, uh, to Total Warhammer Battlefleet Gothic playing on a TV in the front window. And when you walk in, there's a demo console set up on the wall. You can play Space Marine on it. And to the left, there's a display case full of miniatures like you see in the game. And to the right are copies of the game. And beside them, the boxed set with the miniatures. It's all there inviting you to take it all in. The store will be clean. And the color palette of the store would represent this. And I really want to belabor the point that the dark, dingy dungeon should be replaced with a bright, modern aesthetic. Tons of lighting, lots of clear acrylic and glossy surfaces. There will be a small social area with a couple of couches and a big TV on the wall playing Warhammer TV videos, such as original stories, painting tutorials, things like that. The store has five key zones. And in fact, 
I made a 3D digital model so that I can show you this. So as you enter into the store here, you're gonna be greeted with the desk first of all. Either side of it, we have our display windows. These will have dioramas surrounding the televisions which are playing the product. As you move in, there'll be a set of cabinets with different displays and maybe even the demo tables. Over to the side will be a gaming console with a small display set up showing the miniatures of whatever game is currently in there. To the right of that will be shelving. All of this shelving here is going to contain merchandise and specialist games. As you move down towards the back of the store here, we have a social area, somewhere for people to sit down in between games and just nerd out. It's not there for eating and drinking. There's no food like that in this store. A few drinks maybe, bottles of water, but this is not your basement hangout. From there, we move to the painting table with all of the painting merchandise displayed on the back wall panel here. After that, we come into the main area of the store where we have all of our games tables lined up just for customer use and they're encouraged to use it in fact. All of these walls are containing the premier products that are being sold in the store and we have TVs facing internally into the store. Again, playing the IP for people to see. It's bright, it's flashy, it's showing the it's showing the property off. And when there's events on being held within the store, the staff can bring up things like the scores on the televisions here. As for in the central area itself, where the staff hang out, the floor is tiled instead of carpeted. And that tiling will have things like Imperial Aquilas, Chaos Stars on the floor. And there'll be merchandise all around the counter, the brand new releases displayed on the outside of this oval shaped bench. It's just tempting you. If you're standing at the counter and you see the release right there, why don't you just grab it, put it on the counter, add it to what you're buying. And those tiles extend all the way through so that when people are at the painting bench and they spill their paint on the ground, well, it's not just staining the carpet like in all the dingy stores currently. This is an inviting space. And this mock-up here is a two scale, 12 meter environment with four by four tables. This is what I imagine a Games Workshop store should look like. Sleek, modern, professional, the entry point to your hobby. This store is encouraged, designed for people who are going to enter and be in, in sort of enhanced, entranced by this hobby, okay? This is the point of entry to the hobby for most people. The store should be in plain sight with a buzz of activity and it's far more of a draw than a dank box in an alleyway that most of the one-man stores are now. The people running these stores, they'll also be recruited from the best possible staff. Not the kind who hump your leg for a sale, but those who have smooth personalities and natural charisma. They will not have sales targets. The point of this store shouldn't be to sell your models. It's to pique your interest, to get everyone who walks past this store talking about it, to go, I wanna go in there and try that. The store is a flagship, it's a representative of the brand. It is the first impression, and the thing with first impressions is that you only get one. Yeah, you might lose some money on running an expensive three-man store in a prime location. In fact, you will lose money from the pure standpoint of direct dollars in versus direct dollars out, but exposure and getting people interested in the hobby is huge. The store I frequented growing up, it was right next to the cinemas and when the Lord of the Rings came out, do you wanna take a guess at how many kids walked out of that theater after watching Fellowship of the Ring and saw a Lord of the Rings boxed game in the windows of that store and came in and bought a box? Let's just say it was more than four kids. Now contrast this with the dungeon stores currently dotted around the countryside and how many are having kids walking through Knife Crime Alley at 7pm cruising for an IP to invest in. Also, this approach will aim to make the stores more mainstream and accepted, as well as uh, more accessible than they currently are. This is not a hobby to be ashamed of. It's a highly talented hobby with a creative edge and you too can come and take part in it. Bring a friend, sit in the social area, watch a show, play a game, enjoy the hobby. 
One of the biggest failings with Warhammer, of course, is sponsored events. And with sponsored events, the utter lack of events they run outside of the UK is a huge problem. They have involvement with some events in the USA and Europe, but outside of Warhammer World, there aren't grand tournaments of old. There should be a strong emphasis on having an annual event in every major market, or four events annually, in places like the USA, Australia, UK, Europe, and for each major game system. These events would take place quarterly, and with a 40k, 30k, Sigma and Lord of the Rings event. With their subversions such as Kill Team, Underworld, Titanicus, Epic Battle Companies, Blood Bowl, playing concurrently at these events. This way people don't have to choose, will they play 40k or Lord of the Rings at this one event? No, by spreading them out over the year, you can play multiple systems. At the event venue, Games Workshop products will also be sold. You just got your ass kicked by Tyranids? Hey, why don't you go over there and maybe you buy some Tyranids of your own? Like how stores are the entry point to the hobby, the staff also now get to say to the visitors, there's a big Warhammer event coming up at the end of March. If you collect some stuff, you could go and play there with people from all around the country. And you better believe, knowing that they can actually play other people, that motivates people to want to try and achieve the goal of doing just that. This next section I call additional marketing tactics because evil, and it is. This is where we talk a little bit darker because unfortunately we have to talk marketing and marketing is manipulation. Currently, Games Workshop markets with FOMO, the fear of missing out, and FOMO is effective, but it's crude and it's sloppy and it makes people angry with the terrible level of supply and demand. So what legal slightly less abusive tactics can we employ that are more invasive, more parasitic? Well, how about a system where you earn free points towards your Skulls Rewards program for every online avatar you have, which is a Warhammer official avatar. For every continuous month your Steam account has a Space Marine profile picture, you earn five Skull Points. You don't have to do anything, you just set your picture and hey, you're accruing points towards free stuff. How simple is that? Maybe you have a Warhammer app on your mobile. If you log into this daily app and, oh, I don't know, maybe you get a friend to scan a QR code as a first time introduction, you get some skull points. If you take someone into the Games Workshop store and they scan a QR code in store and it's their first visit to Games Workshop, maybe you both get a free model, one for them to paint and one for you as a thank you for introducing a friend. How neat is that? You can also limit this by having a maximum number of linked accounts, so you can't have a bot farm with 500 fake profiles each earning free points. I think 5 sounds like a nice round number to me. We also allow people to accrue points on the Warhammer Ladder, a career progress pathway where every time you complete your first achievement, you get a gift of some sort. You paint your first model, you get a tick on the chart, you buy your first box set, you get another tick, complete a playable force, get a free miniature, and you paint your first big kit, oh, that's definitely a reward. Each stage rewards participant with bonuses and builds that sense of accomplishment while digging the hooks of addiction in at the same time. The point I'm making here, horribly, is that you don't have to make kits with limited supply, you simply have to get people psychologically addicted and have the kits there for them to purchase. New releases come with bonus rewards to encourage buying them. You throw in a free miniature from the range every new release and watch how many people think that they're getting great value because instead of buying $350 of World Eaters, if they buy $500, they get a free Khan the Betrayer, a model that costs $1.20 to produce, but you con them into spending another you know, $150 than they planned. They got a free character, they think they got a deal, but you upsold them $150. Now, I'm possibly more evil than Games Workshop saying this, but like I've said in previous videos, I was senior management in the company and I understand the tactics and I understand the goal is money. I want to make Games Workshop earn through volume, not through just cranking the prices 15% every two years. It's simple, but it's so counterproductive in a world where store-bought toys are becoming less lucrative. Production woes. 
With the slowdown in the system turnover that I desire, this also means a releases slowdown. We are moving from new release hype to hype to participate in the hobby due to strategies like those ones that I mentioned previously. This combined with the 3D printing changes I propose would lead to decreased production pressures. I would like to shrink several product lines, including the Primaris down, not having so many nearly identical units fulfilling the same roles, with an eventual aim to stock most of, if not the entire range in the store, and in that big 12 meter store, you can do it. I would also like to integrate stock tracking and such more intimately within the supply chain so that at all times what is needed and what is known and is had at all staff levels can be accessed. This will prevent things like confused staff at Warhammer World not knowing what stock they have or what stock is being sent over from production. Communication here is huge and the company is one of the most poorly integrated I've seen in my life. In fact, they're downright awful at, at communication across the company and they're led about by the nose by the all too powerful and influential marketing department who is actually quite bad at their job chasing trends that are five years old and succeeding in sales in spite of their talent not because of it thanks to these changes true stock levels will be better understood which allows resupply planning ordering to be far more organized and advanced and for prediction of supply and demand to be far more on point. The fluff. So last on our list of topics today is the fluff. The rules and fluff will be codified and fixed. And I mean the rules as in the rules of the universe here with a consistent canon created. I'm sick of the company dumping on the IP to create sales with contradictory rules and stupid things that go against the established rules of the universe alongside arguments of, it's all canon, not everything is true, and other such pseudo-philosophical tripe. The thing about fluff you have to understand, viewers, is some people really care about it. Some don't care. So those that don't care will always be satisfied, which means you only have to please those that do care. So why does Games Workshop focus on the inverse of this? It's foolish and it's an easy fix. An IP with consistent canon is stronger for it and it draws in the fans and creates stronger bonds because of it. Just look at how Star Trek was handled up until JJ Abrams and his mate Alex Kurtzman ruined it by ignoring canon and shoehorning their own sci-fi show into a Star Trek skin like a deranged ghoulish skinwalker. Games Workshop is on the cusp of actions like that, with how they let their writers develop terrible stories and bizarre directions they take their characters in, along with inconsistent portrayals of the characters. Establish ground rules, establish a true canon. This is how you strengthen the IP and create investment, because now there are set stakes. Conclusion. The thing is, at the end of the day, I will never be a part of Games Workshop. I will never be in a position to change them, and even if I was, the blowback from all the aggrieved managers in the middle would be huge. And even if I got past that, what would the shareholders on the board agree? In any case, some of these ideas would be very easy to implement. They can hire me as a consultant any time, and I'm not a expensive price either. But let's be honest, they'll just steal the marketing ideas I have in here, take four years to apply them, whilst paying themselves on the back for a job well done for their original and creative ideas that they independently came up with. I have done so many videos discussing the company and their failings over the years, especially with their misunderstanding their market, the success in spite of their actions. I've tried to not only address the problems here, why so many are bad, how they came to be, and more in this video, but also what my solutions would be. It's not a whinge for the sake of a whine, it's me complaining of an issue, providing a resolution to the issue would solve the problem and to the betterment of every interested party. Take this video therefore as a hopefully long-term solution to a problem which I personally have. And that problem is that I feel like crap. I feel like a salty bastard all the time because I feel like I have to call out this anti-consumer behavior all the time, and yet I'm receiving nothing but hassle for doing what's in 
you, the viewer's best interest. How dare I point out these things? Is it really a problem? These are toys. The company needs to make profit. Taxes and shipping cost so much. Why shouldn't they make models just for you, etc., etc.? I've heard it all. And I'm sick of trying to fight the community with one hand and the company with the other. If you cannot admit there could be a problem, or you're at peace with the problem, why should I eternally waste my breath on you? I would rather talk about the war, the background, my personal hobby, the things I enjoy, making my own unique takes on the armies, enjoying my games, talking tactics and ideas. That's my goal. Not to be the salty guy that addicted gamers hate, but just to be another guy talking his hobby online. And this video is designed to be a release for me, a final chance to change some opinions and now I can bow out of critical content for a while, okay, and I can I can just enjoy the playing. I can go back to making the videos about building armies and paint schemes and talking about how other people built their armies and their creative paint schemes. Those are things I like doing. I don't like talking about every time Games Workshop makes a mistake. They do it too often. And I'm giving you some of the solutions here today. Not all of them, but enough of them that you get a pretty good idea of where my head's at. Anyway, that's it for me. I'm Mac with the Outer Circle. This was a big video, I think over 40 odd minutes, probably 50 minutes by the end of it. I want you to tell me what your thoughts are. Give me that feedback in the comment below. And I'm gonna say something that I very rarely say. Maybe share this video, maybe like this video. I want it shared around because I want people to understand what we could have and maybe if it gets to the right people just maybe they could take some of the better ideas here on board and do something especially starting with the not having prices going up four times faster than wages I feel like if we don't do something soon kids won't be able to buy into this hobby and if kids don't buy into this hobby you just got a bunch of 30 year old neck beards jerking each other and that's no good anyway I'm Mac with the Outer Circle. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next video.